Hey guys, back with another weekly educational series video. Today's topic is all about creatine supplementation. I'm going to talk about why as gym trainees we take creatine and how it works. Now, it's common knowledge, and definitely well accepted, that creatine supplementation has a positive benefit on exercise performance and even strength gains. Now, there are numerous studies that also back this uh, common wisdom up. Uh, many studies do show an increase in muscular performance, strength, and even cognitive benefits to creatine supplementation too. And there are a minority of studies that show no benefits to creatine supplementation. However, the weight of the evidence is definitely in favour of creatine. So we do recommend taking creatine if you are serious about your uh, training. Now, the sole purpose of taking creatine is to increase the availability of free creatine, which we'll talk about later, in the muscle cells. Okay, This will facilitate phosphocreatine resynthesis, so PCR, which I'll talk about soon as well, and that will increase the production of ATP, ultimately leading to an increase in short-term muscular performance. Now, I mentioned ATP, and before moving on and talking about the nitty-gritty of creatine, we're gonna to have to cover ATP and I need to make sure that you guys understand what it is before I move on. So ATP is our body's main source of energy. Okay, some people like to term it the energy currency of our cells. And that is because our cells use ATP to power all their biological function. Okay, so you've got ATP. Now it stands for adenosine triphosphate. Okay, and if I was to draw ATP, it would look something like this. Okay, now the chemical structure of ATP looks a little different to what I have drawn here, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to use circles, okay? So we've got an adenosine molecule here that has three phosphates attached to it. Okay, so triphosphate. Now notice how these phosphates are attached via what we call bonds. Okay, so these are high energy phosphate bonds. And the reason we call them high energy bonds is because they actually store all the potential energy that is within ATP. Okay, so if we look at it close up. Okay, that's the bond there and we have two bonds. Now, the potential energy that we get from nutrients that we consume doesn't just directly go to the cells for biological work, okay? It actually gets extracted and trapped, so extracted through macronutrient oxidation, and gets trapped within these bonds for future use, okay? So we trap the potential energy and it actually turns into chemical energy within these bonds. So your body is always trying to maintain ATP homeostasis, just like it is trying to maintain homeostasis for every other system uh, in the body. Now, when there is an imbalance in ATP levels, so ATP levels may become reduced, your body will actually activate certain energy systems, which you may have heard of before, to bring ATP back up, okay, to resynthesize ATP. And it's going to choose the energy systems based on efficiency, sustainability, and the intensity of the movement. Okay, now in the context of resistance training, we will generally be relying on the anaerobic glycolysis system and the ATP PC system, which is super important for what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, we also have aerobic uh, metabolism, which can use carbohydrates through glycolysis, can also use fatty acids. Um, so I'm gonna list them briefly here. So we've got aerobic metabolism, which can use fatty acids, and can also use pyruvate, which comes from glucose, so the breakdown of glucose through anaerobic glycolysis results in pyruvate, and pyruvate can go through aerobic uh, metabolism to be oxidized. Okay, so we've also got the anaerobic system,
Okay, so generally relying on carbohydrate, okay, so glucose, CHO carbohydrate. And we've also got the ATP PC system, okay, which relies on PCR, so phosphocreatine. So the ATP P system has the fastest rate of ATP synthesis, okay? However, it doesn't last very long. So it only lasts up to about 10 seconds. So we'll generally be using this system towards the beginning of the set, you know, those first few reps. After that, the anaerobic glycolytic system will tend to kick in, okay? And we'll, we'll stay active for the remainder of the set. We don't generally use aerobic uh, metabolism while we are resistance training. Okay. Now, as I said earlier, ATP PC system super important for today because creatine can actually help regenerate PCR, which will help us regenerate ATP. Okay, and I'll talk about this uh, soon. So, this is how we oxidize you know, the nutrients that we consume, and as I said earlier, we harvest that energy in these bonds. Okay, so there's high energy phosphate bonds. So our cells can actually extract and transfer the chemical energy within ATP to power all biological forms work, okay, which I did mention previously. And the way this occurs is through the hydrolysis of the ATP molecule. Okay, hydrolysis being the addition of H2O to a certain molecule that breaks it down. Okay, and the way it occurs something like this. Okay. We start off with ATP plus H2O. Now, if you are familiar with fatty acid metabolism, uh, the triglyceride molecule within the, the fatty, the fat cell, also gets hydrolyzed. Okay, so the enzyme hormone sensitive lipase actually adds water, H2O, to the triglyceride molecule three times to kind of break off the fatty acids from the glycerol backbone. Okay, so hydrolysis doesn't is not only exclusive to ATP, okay, it occurs in the body in many other areas. Okay. So anyway, we add H2O to the ATP, and this reaction here is catalyzed by a certain enzyme called ATP ACE. Okay, so we draw it draw something like this. Okay, so ATPase is catalyzing that reaction, and what we end up with is ADP plus PI. Okay, ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate. So obviously, what's happening here is we are breaking off one of these phosphates to use the energy from the bond, and we are left with an adenosine molecule that only has two phosphates, okay? It's still be used for energy. Um, and also, a phosphate, we call that an inorganic phosphate, kind of can't do anything on its own. It needs to be attached um, either back to the ADP to form ATP, or can be attached to creatine to form PCR, okay? But by itself, it doesn't really do much. Okay, now this reaction here is reversible, okay? That ultimately is how we break down ATP to create energy, okay? So as I said, the energy comes from the breaking of a bond. Okay, so that bond breaks and we get energy. When that energy is released, as I said, we are powering a lot of different functions of the body. It could be muscle contraction, it could be nerve signaling, so nerve transmission, could even be digestion, okay, or even the secretion of hormones from certain glands, all right, and not to mention the synthesis of certain tissues, like protein, like muscle, okay, so it's super important to understand that your body solely relies on you know, ATP to power all those certain functions. Okay. So I hope you guys are with me so far. That's a little bit about ATP and why it is so important that we are using creatine to resynthesize ATP at faster rates and to ensure we have a lot of ATP ready to go uh, upon starting a set of resistance training. Okay, so remember ATP helps us um, 
contract our muscles, okay, it's probably going to help us increase our performance if we have enough uh, ready to go and we are resynthesizing it at a fast rate in between sets while we are resting, okay. Now I'm going to talk about how creatine actually enters a muscle cell and helps us resynthesize phosphocreatine. Okay, so this is a muscle here, you could think of that as a bicep. And we're going to talk about how creatine actually enters the cell, okay? So, first off, we consume creatine through supplementation, probably the most effective way of getting our creatine in, although we can uh, get creatine from meat sources too. Now, unfortunately, not many people get sufficient uh, creatine from meat sources, so I definitely recommend uh, consuming creatine uh, through generally monohydrate. But, Anyway, we have meat and creatine, creatine supplementation. They obviously enter the system and go through digestion. Okay. Now from here, they enter the bloodstream and it's important to know that your body actually manufactures its own creatine as well through what we call biosynthesis. This occurs in the liver where certain amino acids are broken down, converted into creatine. So we've got blood, also got. Okay, they go straight to the blood. Now, from the blood, we need to get creatine in the cell. And unfortunately, you can't actually just have creatine shuttled in the cell without there being a specific transporter on the cell membrane to allow creatine to enter in the cell. Okay, we just call this creatine transporter and it acts as like a window that opens up when creatine is ready to enter the cell. So, looks something like this, it sits on the cell membrane there. Now, the interesting thing here, the interesting part about this process is you can't get um, creatine that is coming from an area of low concentration outside of the cell into an area of high concentration within the cell without actually pushing it through the creatine transporter with another molecule. Okay, we call this active transport. Okay, we're trying to get a molecule or a, or a substrate within a certain cell, and we need to actually push it in with uh, something that consists of energy. Okay. In this case, what happens is we get sodium, in most cases, to push creatine through the transporter and into the cell. Okay, so sodium generally supplies Na plus entering in the cell with the creatine. And we are left with a lot of creatines okay, in the cell. So free creatine. Okay, that is what we term the creatine within the cell. As I said before, supplementing with creatine will actually increase the amount of creatine within the cell, okay? And we will also get some sodium uh, ions in the cell too. Now, a lot of people um, who supplement with creatine say that they uh, get a, a lot of fluid retention and they may feel bloated. However, the water retention that comes with uh, creatine supplementation is due to the fact that when creatine enters the cell, so does sodium, and so does water. Okay, so we're getting intramuscular uh, fluid uh, retention. We aren't really getting any subcutaneous fluid retention under the skin. Okay, so creatine doesn't really cause uh, bloating unless you aren't consuming sufficient amounts of water. Okay, creatine should actually make your muscles look a lot fuller because it's pulling water in with it into the muscle cell. Okay. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. If you are feeling bloated from creatine supplementation, I'd probably recommend you dropping your dosage slightly and increasing more water and then bringing the dosage back up to a point where you don't feel uh, very bloated. Really, you should only be consuming about five grams of creatine monohydrate on a daily basis, okay? So as I said, okay, we've got a lot of free creatine within the cell now. And let's just pretend that you know, you've done a set of bicep curls and Within the cell, we don't have much ATP left. Okay, we've got more ADP and more inorganic phosphates. Okay, so ADP, and we've got the PIs just sitting there. 
so now that we are left with high amount of ADP uh, and inorganic phosphates within the cell, your body is going to respond to this by activating an energy system that can resynthesize ATP in the most efficient manner. When you are training with weights, obviously rest periods are short, which means a high amount of creatine within the cell is going to allow you to resynthesize PCR, so phosphocreatine, at a faster, more efficient rate. Meaning when you are about to do your next set, okay, ATP is fully stocked and ready to go. Okay, generally in this case, it's going to be the ATP P system that is used. So what happens is creatine actually combines with the inorganic phosphates, okay, and we get the uh, phosphate creatine. Okay, now the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called creatine kinase, and creatine kinase has a very high concentration within the muscle cell. Okay, and very high activity levels too. This is why ATP can be synthesized at such a fast rate through the phosphocreatine system. Okay, because creatine kinase is all over the muscle cell. Okay, so as I said, uh, creatine. Okay, then we are left obviously with uh, PCRs. Yeah. Okay. So phosphocreatine um, concentration within the muscle cell obviously increases when this reaction occurs. So what happens now is the PCR that has been regenerated actually combines with all these ADP molecules that have been left around from the hydrolysis of ATP okay, and actually proceeds to resynthesize more ATP. Okay, as I said, this occurs in a very fast manner, okay, but unfortunately when we start resistance training, and we start doing you know, our first few reps, ATP gets burned pretty quickly and we have to start relying on the anaerobic glycolysis system. However, having that ATP restocked um, before undergoing a set can definitely help with performance and possibly strength. So the reaction looks something like this. Um, ADP plus PCR. Okay, so we get ADP plus phosphocreatine, that results in ATP plus free creatine. Okay, and that is a reversible reaction. But then we are left with a whole bunch of ATPs within the cell. Okay, and that is how your body uses creatine that you consume. Um, generally through supplementation to resynthesize phosphocreatine and ultimately increase ATP production, which allows us to perform uh, better. Okay, once we start a set, we've got full stock of ATP ready to be used. Okay, we don't need to rely on the anaerobic glycolysis system as of yet. Okay, so we start with ATP PC system, we burn it out, and then move on to the anaerobic glycolysis system. Okay. This also delays the onset of fatigue okay, because we're kind of conserving this energy system and using ATP PC first. So that is also another reason why we may be able to eke out a few extra reps um, throughout a set if we are supplementing with creatine um, effectively. So with creatine, I recommend using creatine monohydrate. Uh, generally, is the most effective source of creatine. I recommend taking anywhere between 5 to 10 grams a day. You don't necessarily need to load creatine, you can, however, you can get similar effects or the same effects um, from taking that maintenance dose of 5 to 10 grams a day uh, consistently. Okay, as I said before, if you're feeling bloated with creatine uh, supplementation, you may want to drink a little more water okay, because remember, creatine pulls water in the cells, so drop your dosage slightly, increase your water intake, and you should be fine. Okay guys, so I hope you have a better understanding on what ATP is and how we can use creatine to increase uh, ATP production within muscle cells whilst we are training and how that is going to lead to a possible increase in muscular performance. So I'll also be uploading a post on Instagram soon about creatine and some of its indirect effects which may help with muscle growth. So be sure to follow me and check that out.
But to end this video, I hope you guys have a full understanding of what I explained today. And as always, let me know if you have any questions about today's topic. Thanks.